Taylor Lorenz, one of the worst journalists to ever fucking exist, and that's saying a lot. A woman who cries about doxing, but then dox lived at TikTok and her entire family and then physically showed up to their front doors. A woman who cried about the Kiwi Farms and said that we drove people to suicide, despite the fact that if we did anything even close to what Taylor Lorenz did to live at TikTok, we would be blocked, blotted out of existence. I would be arrested. It would be the end of everything. Uh, she walked away with it, no problem. But she was finally removed from her position as a Washington Post journalist. Was it for saying uh, dumb shit about avocado toast? No. Was it for helping a drug addict fundraise a hundred thousand Canadian dollars uh, by lying about a legal U.S. company? No. Was it for doxing lived a TikTok and showing up at her family's house? No. It was for calling Joe Biden a war criminal. Um, she took a pro-Palestine stance, which of course upset the true owners of the Washington Post. And a uh, investigation was launched into her claims that Joe Biden was a war criminal due to his uh, aid for Israel. And a mere, was it like 70 days later, she was let go from the Washington Post. I think not even 70 days. I think it was um, like 45 or something. So she crossed the line. She did the one thing that she's not, the, the thin blue line that separates society from total chaos and uh, peace and tranquility like we enjoy. And uh, she was fired as a result. She promptly decided that she was going to launch her own substack called User Mag. And she says, Personal news, I'm going independent and launching my own media outlet on Substack called User Mag. Please consider buying a yearly subscription to help me continuing my work. Her own supporters uh, demonize this decision. That's seventy dollars, by the way, for an annual subscription. And there was a screenshot that I don't have. And these are just people making fun of her. There was a, a series of of her supporters in the reply saying that they can't support her in good conscience because the money would go to Substack. And Substack, of course, is a Nazi profile because they allow people like me to publish articles about how Liz Fong Jones is a terrorist. Um, so therefore, they can't support her. <laughs> so I guess that uh, that cancel culture fucking purity spiral is really working out for her. She can't even get money in the one platform that would take her, which is a open platform to everybody, uh, because her own supporters hate the fact that that platform is open to everybody. So I guess you could say you get what you fucking deserve. But before we celebrate, chat, there's actually a body of work related to her leaving that I want to read through, that I haven't really read through, and that we may find entertaining. So let's start with this. Her first post to the User Mag uh, says, Introducing User Magazine, why I'm leaving legacy media to pursue independent journalism. Um, one of the things that, about her departure is that she does not say she was fired. She says that she's leaving legacy journalism to pursue independent journalism for the purity of the journalism, uh, which is a very uh, nice way of her saying that she was fucking fired. Uh, she says, Today, I'm excited to launch my new publication, User Magazine, on Substack, under which I will pursue the type of reporting that, th on the lowercase i, first sentence, first publication, F fucking minus. Which internet are you going to be reporting on, Taylor? Are you going to be reporting on the DPRK's internet? Are you going to be re reporting on China's internet? Or what about Russia's internet? Are you going to be talking about the EU's internet? Or what about uh, DARPA? No? Oh, do you mean the internet? That one. That's the one you're going to be reporting on. Okay, I got you. Uh, which has become increasingly difficult to do in corporate media. We now live in a world where politicians can post their way into office Memes fuel our stock market, and online culture and mainstream culture are so deeply intertwined that it's impossible to tell where one ends and the other begins. User Mag is founded on the belief that the real story of technology lies with its users. Instead of focusing on corporate or earnings, earnings, sorry, earn, 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 uh, and mainstream culture are so deeply intertwined that it's impossible to tell where one ends and the other begins. User Magazine is founded on the belief uh, that the real story of technology lies with its users instead of focusing on corporate... I already read that. I read that exact same sentence. 
I will move to the next one, then. I will be reporting on what people and movements that are steering technology and lowercase i internet culture, from weird online phenomena to under-the-radar trends to content creator platform developments, policy initiatives, and the powerful forces that shape our online world. It's about who has power on the lowercase i internet and how that power is being wielded. Bitch! That's my fucking show. You think uh, the the <laughs> the users on the internet, the new podcast by Taylor Lorenz, talking about weird online phenomena, under the radar trends, content creators, platform developments, policies, and the powerful forces that shape our. Yeah, she's just trying to steal my fucking shtick, chat. She's gonna be talking about Boogie Two Nine and Eight here shortly. User mag will be arrive via email one to three times a week, and paid subscribers will have commenting privileges, access to subscriber-only chats, and will receive exclusive deep dive analysis pieces, among other benefits. I think you could get these same benefits from an OnlyFans. <laughs> that doesn't really sound like a journo access thing. It will include a mix of originally reported articles, interviews, and links to what I'm reading and watching online. Oh, boy. Uh, her reading list. How exciting. Of course, I'll still be doing my weekly tech and online culture news podcast, Powered User, available to all platforms. If you're a brand that would like to advertise on my podcast or collaborate in any way, please reach out to usermag.co. By the way, I received my first book offer. Someone randomly emailed me a book offer saying, do you want a hard copy of a book about... um?" I think it was bias and how we read statistics. So that when you read a statistic about how black men rape like a thousand times more often than white men, despite the difference in population, um, I, I need to relearn how I my cognitive biases interpret those facts literally instead of through the uh, adjudicating and adjustment lens that's required to understand such big numbers. I said yes, by the way. I don't think I'll get it. <laughs> When I started my career as an independent blogger, my goal was to provide a counter-narrative to the technology and online culture coverage I was seeing in the mainstream media. Many traditional journalists at the time sneered at bloggers, dismissed online fandoms, ignored the near, now nearly half a trillion dollar content creator industry, and failed to recognize the ways in which the lowercase i internet was upending our culture, economy, and political system. As digital media rose, many of us early bloggers and content creators were scooped up by old institutions. Okay, here's the real content here. Finally, finally, this journalist breaking into 2024 as a 50-something-year-old woman about to write hard-hitting lowercase i internet pieces cuts to the quick about the issues people really care about. She says, Take, for example, Gamergate, which started almost exactly 10 years ago in August 2014, a Vatashed moment that revealed exactly how little the traditional media understood about online culture. In the decades since, the legacy media has ignored every single major lesson that could have been learned about the lowercase i internet's capacity for mass mobilization and the way bad actors warp public discourse and weaponize the media itself. So boring. I'm going to skip to the end. Unfortunately, I'm not independently wealthy. I have to pay rent, living expenses, and significant medical costs. She got celiac disease. She always sharten. Help. <laughs> my adult diapers aren't covered by Medicaid. Help me. <laughs> I got celiac. I'm so incurring I'm also incurring significant costs associated with operating independently including business and software fees, paying for things like design work, editing support, Subscription to research materials, lowercase i, internet costs, equipment, and more. I have zero investors or corporate backing. <laughs> you know it's a bad sign when my ass has more help than yours, Taylor. <laughs> Maybe you suck. <laughs> okay, let's watch your stupid fucking video. There's a part that I want to... I'll skip to if it sucks. And Hi, I'm Taylor Lorenz, and you might know me from my best-selling book, Extremely Online, which covers the rise of the content creator. I'm actually really shocked that she... um. She sounds like such a, a Southern California Valley girl. I expected something a little bit different, I guess. Extremely online, the untold story of fame, influence, and power on the... I mean, that might be lowercase i. It's hard to tell because it's all small caps. Industry or my work covering also, tech and online. really, really good font choice for that. I just want to nitpick this. Um, 
if I was writing a book and I wanted to impress people with a bold font choice, I would definitely pick Impact, the the cat meme font out there. But today I'm excited to announce that I'm leaving Legacy Media to launch my own new publication on Substack called User Magazine. Under User Mag, I'll be pursuing the type of reporting on the internet that has become increasingly difficult to do in corporate media. User Mag will cover technology from the user side. It's about who has power on the internet and how that power is being wielded. I'll be reporting on the people Does and movements mean? that steer internet. Do I have power chat? Unlimited power! That's me. I want to see Taylor Lorenz's hit piece about how I'm... Once I start my 501c4 and we march on D.C., she'll be writing about me. She'll be the only independent journalist taking the Kiwi Farm seriously. Sure, from weird online phenomena to under-the-radar trends to platform developments to the powerful forces shaping our online world. I hope you'll consider buying a yearly subscription to User Mag to help me continue my work. The link is below and in my bio. I'll still be hosting my weekly tech news podcast called Power User, available on all podcast platforms and YouTube, and I'll be ramping up my long-form videos on YouTube as well. But I want to talk about why I'm leaving legacy media and choosing to return to independent journalism. When I started my career as an fired. Because you were fired. Because you said Joe Biden. Joe Biden should not be giving money to Israel. Independent blogger 15 years ago, I had no background in journalism. I was a recent college grad. It was a big recession. I was working retail, temp jobs. I worked at a call center. And I began to build an audience on the internet. I did. Dude. Um, if, if you have a headset on, especially when it's higher quality, you might be able to hear this. There is a sound in the back of her room, and I don't know how to describe it. It kind of sounds like if you took a coat hanger, like a metal coat hanger, and just dragged it along like the concrete of a warehouse, you would get this effect. And I don't know what the fuck's wrong with her mic, but it sounds like that. I did not go to some fancy journalism school. I did not have industry connections, and I really didn't know that much about traditional news media and how it worked. But I did know they were getting one big story very, very wrong. As somebody who spent a lot of time... I, do want, I, I definitely, when I listen to a podcast, I want somebody who lives in a construction site and you can hear the angle grinder of the next door neighbor throughout the entire podcast. And in early communities on Tumblr and early YouTube, I was so frustrated by the way traditional media was covering the internet. Traditional media smeared at bloggers, they dismissed online fandoms, they ignored the now nearly half a trillion dollar content creator industry, they mocked What the, the fuck? Dude, dude, I figured out what it is. That sound... She's in a coffee shop. She's recording this in a coffee shop. I could hear the steam thing from the coffee machine, the espresso machine. I remember those sounds from when I worked in a coffee shop and when I did my programming job. She's sitting in a coffee shop recording this and you can hear them making cappuccinos in the background that women were building online and they just basically fundamentally were unable to grasp how the internet was upending our culture, economy, and entire political system. Literally just last week on Instagram threads, traditional journalists were arguing if internet culture reporting is real journalism in the year 2024. Anyway, so I started writing my own stories to provide a counter narrative to the type of coverage that I was seeing in the mainstream media. As digital media arose in the 2010s, a lot of us early bloggers and content creators were scooped up by these old school institutions that, to be honest, kind of previously looked down on us. Let I mean, that's called making it. Like, if you're just a blogger and then you get hired by the fucking, like, like Washington Post, you made it. You started your own career. You skipped through all the nepotistic, like, dick sucking that you have to go through in journalism school to get a job. The kind of shit that Ralph would never be able to do. And you skipped right to the good part, having a comfy 9 to 5 where you just fucking grind, you know? As long as you don't go on social media and fuck it up by being a retard, uh, you got your next 20 years planned out for you. That's making it, bro. Legacy Media tried desperately to position itself as a credible source for online culture news. But for all their power and prestige, I would argue they have proven themselves fundamentally unable to cover today's chaotic, contentious, fast-paced, and highly nuanced online media landscape. There are so many internet and online Patilla culture Lorenz stories. Can. She's mastered this. This half of, How is she verified with half of... With 20,000? That's fine. Dude, they're such nepotistic fucks in California. We need a pa, pa, judo chop. California up into six pieces. The six Californias. We need it more than ever. 8,000 views. And let's take a look here. It's your last videos. Why every online store sells the same crappy products. Uh, because advertise people selling products will put their product on multiple platforms so that they get sold, regardless of where the customer is. And there's no reason not to do that. Um, 
Why Instagram Reels so unhinged? Brazil's ban on X for 9-11 for Stan accounts. Um, what? Can Elon and Twitter save Trump? My smartphone freaking freak out is harming children. Is Skibbity Toilet the next Hollywood blockbuster? 40 minutes! 40 fucking minutes on Skibbity Toilet! Okay, we'll watch that one next. It's that the traditional media has failed to cover well. I was thinking of Gamergate recently because it started almost 10 years ago. Exactly. In August 2014. And it became this one. 10 years ago, bitch! It's been a fucking decade! Half the population of planet fucking Earth wasn't alive when Gamergate happened. What the fuck are you talking about? shed moment in online culture and it really revealed just how little traditional media understood the dynamics of the internet the traditional press struggled to cover this story not because they didn't have the resources but because they fundamentally failed to understand online culture and i would argue they still don't there's a reason that some of the biggest internet culture stories today from crypto scams to bad behavior from youtube's biggest stars to thoughtful cultural commentary about online niches comes from content creators not the traditional media and I don't think that's a failure or reflection on the many brilliant and amazing journalists still working in the traditional world. Literally every tech reporter I've worked with has been so amazing and brilliant. And there it? are so many talented... Somebody back there is uh, putting that, that cream on the, the top of the latte, so in a little flower. ...that culture reporters who have been laid off because the business model of legacy media is so fundamentally broken. There's also a lot of really amazing editors at certain places that get it. But we now... I th I think that th the issue is, is that old publications are just catering to a different audience. Like, bo boomers and millennials don't care about Mr. Beast. They have no fucking idea who Mr. Beast is, and therefore they have no inclination to post articles about m fucking Mr. Beast. They care about shit like the EU, a trade deal between the United States and the UAE regarding oil, um, taxes. <laughs> Uh, things that most people don't give a fuck about because it's like, who gives a shit? How can I, I can't even possibly feign interest in the, the Sudanese civil war and how the evil Russian influence is about trying to get gold from Sudan so that Russia can use Sudanese gold to bypass trade restrictions and sanctions so that evil Putin can, can continue with his imperialist conquest of a democratic country. Dun dun dun. But the Washington Post cares about that kind of shit. Most fucking, like, 20-year-olds don't. You know what I mean? It's like a completely different audience. I live in this world where politicians can post their way into office, where memes fuel the stock market, where the boundaries between mainstream culture and internet culture are so deeply intertwined that it's impossible to tell where one ends and the other begins. The internet isn't just another beat. It's a living, breathing ecosystem that transforms rapidly and unpredictably. The pace, the culture, the very nature of how information spreads online is so you know fundamentally what's kind of different than Is that she's like implying what I want to do with user mag is I want to do traditional written journalism about the new era of content creators who are independently successful based purely on where interest naturally fluctuates and gravitates to. But the problem with that proposition is that you're simply saying that you want to become a journalist about an already extant kind of journalism. Like the, the some ordinary gamer types just talking about, you know, the pop culture shit that's happening. That is the journalism. You can't therefore then do an article about some ordinary gamers and then say like, oh, M Mudahar did X, Y, Z. And, and be successful about it. She she wants to do it backwards. And and what's really, it's kind of weird because it's like her position is like a 40-something-year-old woman's position about trying to do what an 18-something-year-old is going to do. Like an 18 year old who wants to be a content creator is going to look at successful people and try to emulate them and hope that they catch their own flame. And Taylor Lorenz is doing the exact thing, the exact same thing, but from her perspective, except she's going to bring her journalism credentials to it. And it's like you're, you're it's like you're starting over from scratch. Like you, you want to transition from old school mainstream literate, you know, writing journalism to content creator on YouTube <laughs> in the same way that, a, that an 18 year old boy at Whataburger is going to try to become a content creator on YouTube by doing video game streams. Uh, it's kind of sad when you think about it like that.
anything that ever came before it. And legacy media in its current form is simply not built to cover this world. These institutions were designed for a different era, where news was slower, more centralized, where a few gatekeepers could control the narrative, where reporters certainly didn't have direct access to their audiences in the same way, and where institutional power prevailed. But the internet has blown all of that up. And as the landscape has evolved, it has become clear to me that the legacy media is no longer the right primary environment for the type of work that I want to do. I've always operated in this weird liminal space where I've been labeled a content <laughs> Liminal space? Are you Nick Fuentes? What the fuck are you talking about? My struggle to find a place in the MS is because you're fucking dumb, lady. Creator, an influencer, as much as a journalist. And the truth is that. Dude, I I'm so right. She's calling herself a content creator on Lady. Dude, you're going to be so sad. You just left the Washington Post, and this is the most attention you'll ever get. Like, remember when, um,. All those guys left second, um, left uh, the the zero the zero punctuation guy. They all left the Escapist magazine, and they started Second Wind. And there was all that energy, and they're like, finally, we get to do stuff without the creative control of that fucking asshole. We're gonna be, you know, creator focused. We're all gonna own shares in this company. And they got like hundreds of thousands, millions of views of people like, wow, these guys are still around, and they're fighting the system and shit. And it's like you can say whatever you want about Second Wind and what happened after they did that, but that's like. If you don't land that, if you don't like land that uh, that first thing, it's a grind. It's a, it's a slog. I remember um, there's a there's a book by the the Dilbert guy, Scott Adams, and I read this book. It's called um, How to Fail at Everything and Still Win Big. And I've read through this book, and I think the most prominent thing that I learned from that was his his um. His theory that if something doesn't seem to have a lot of positive response and attention when it's launched, it's probably never going to get that. There's like the occasional outlier who like does does like a grind and then slowly builds up success. But generally speaking, if something novel is launched and there's no fascination or interest or, or hype up behind it whatsoever, it doesn't stand a fucking chance. And I think that's really accurate. And if you're launching your big, you know run at being an independent journalist and you're getting 8,000 views and a, a smattering of supportive replies on Twitter, you're probably fucked. That's probably your peak. You're, you're probably never going to see more than that. I've always been both, but the legacy media is not set up for people like me. In today's media environment, these silly distinctions between who's a real content creator or a real journalist are so meaningless. We're all part of the same media ecosystem. We can all have a voice online. And I don't need a job at a 200 year old institution to reach people, break news, and have an impact on the world. The journalists I'm most inspired by today are those who have taken their voices back into their own Name hands. names. Independent who? content creators who, who challenge powerful who? institutions and carve out their own space in Name a names. media landscape. By going independent, I hope to do more of what I Why did your jacket open? Oh, it's, I thought it was like button and she was like, um, let me open this jacket just in case. Love. Helping people understand the world around them, inspiring them to build a better internet, exposing online radicalization, <laughs> holding power She's wearing a mask outside. <laughs> to account, and also just having a lot more fun. I want to do all of this without worrying about some corporate overlord and without the constraints of institutions that at times are more concerned with optics than challenging power. I want to write freely and speak directly to people on YouTube, TikTok. Is it me? Am I her? Am I the creator that inspires Taylor Lorenz? Oh my gosh i can't believe it podcast i want to run my silly meme pages i also firmly meme pages meme pages it's 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 the easiest gambit in the whole world you see when you start your independent news journalism what you do is you start up the meme page on facebook go around and find a couple cat pics a day and they upload them to the Taylor Lorenz meme page. And then there will be natural organic growth. And a couple of these people will become annual subscribers of your user magazine. And then that's how you get them. That's how you get a foundation for your independent journalism. Everybody does it. Everybody does it. There's no shame in the cat page. Just start your cat page, your meme page. And, and you'll make it bigly. Believe that this era of faux neutrality in journalism is over. I will always be upfront and honest about my perspectives and where I'm coming from. And I will be a biased hack. I will admit this to your fucking face. I will, <laughs> I will poison every single thing that I think and do and say and write 
uh, with my inherent biases, and I won't even try to get people to benefit from doubt, because why the fuck would I do that? That's not where the money is. You might disagree with me, and I actually might be wrong some of the time, but I'd rather hear that than pretend that I'm not a human being with certain perspectives on the world. To me, this transparency is the essence of trust in journalism. Unfortunately, I'm not independently wealthy. I have rent to pay, <laughs> significant If there's anything in the whole world to sum up my perspectives on life, it's that I, unfortunately, am not independently wealthy. <laughs> I, think that, I think that sentiment resonates with a lot of people. Medical costs. I have zero investors and no corporate backing. So if you're watching this video, I sincerely hope that you buy a paid subscription to User Magazine to support my work on YouTube and off. The link is in my bio and in the description below. I really want to make most of the work that I do available without a paywall, but I can only do that if I get enough paid subscribers to cover my costs. The internet has given us the tools to tell our own stories, to reach audiences directly, and to build something new. That's what I intend to do, and I hope you'll support me on this journey by sharing this video, smashing the subscribe or follow button, and buying a paid subscription. Wait, wait did it do it for her when, I, when she said it? This journey by sharing this video smashing the subscribe or follow button it doesn't youtube's like don't do it we're not gonna put glitter magic on this fucking subscribe button for taylor lorenz don't even bother we know it's we know it's fucking trash don't even don't even don't waste your time don't waste our bandwidth <laughs> um wow yeah that's a terrible pitch and i think one thing I didn't mention this during the video, but I saved it towards the end. I think one thing that she's really, really underestimating, because she bitches and moans that, oh, the Washington Post kept telling me, Taylor, you're being a deranged cunt again. We can't have psychopaths running around doxing people. It hurts the Washington Post brand. We already look like shit. We're already owned by Jeff Bezos. We already run cover stories for Amazon. But with a whole dachshund, especially when a god's chosen, it's not a good luck for us, Tala. You gotta calm down there. And she's like, oh, I hate you, Washington Post. Yes, you pay my bills, but fuck you. Fuck you. What she doesn't realize is that the only reason she had any notoriety whatsoever is that the things that she did carried the attribute, the label of... Washington Post journalist. The reason why she can talk to Taylor Lorenz, she was talking about how I had the most fun when I was doing my interview with Taylor, uh, sorry, uh, Chaya Rachik, is like, the reason why these people even fucking talk to you is that you're associated with the Washington Post. You have no clout, you have no um, reputation, you have no independent any anything, any asset whatsoever. You've brought nothing from the Washington Post to an independent medium. So it's not like <clears throat> the Washington Post lost its best financial analyst, a guy who called big crashes and big boons in the stock market, a guy who wrote about a company that was worth a dollar and now it's worth a thousand dollars. And he goes out and he starts his independent financial times magazine because he, get, he had a dispute with his, his editor in regards to a favorable story about a conservative business, something like that. <clears throat> it's like you have negative reputation. So nobody's gonna nobody cares what you have to say. And without the, the potential of making it into the Washington Post and boosting your own business as a byproduct, you don't have any clout as a journalist to get interviews with people. All you can do is write puff pieces for fucking bread tube. <laughs> that's what she's going to end up doing. She's going to be ending up writing puff pieces about that tranny that's a bread tuber that um, is like an actor now in those uh, British movies. And she's going to have to try to make a living out that way. Safa Taylor. By the way, did I even mention? Did I even mention that uh, Taylor Lorenz sided with Keffels? And I think. Let's see if there's an article. I don't know if she actually wrote a full blown article about this. Let's see, Taylor Lorenz, Washington Post, and then Kiwi Farm. Let's see if we got something here. Ooh, I'm seeing a couple things. No author attribute. Oh, Joseph, she did. Oh, Taylor. Remember when you wrote this article about Cloudflare and the Kiwi Farms and you called us a bunch of fucking murderers and you published this shit in the Washington Post? And then um, you wrote this article about libs of TikTok. Did you mention Kiwi Farms in this? Because it shows up. Oh, no, it's just a it's a related article, I guess. But you remember when you wrote this? You called us murderers, Taylor? I remember this. 
Oh, look, she even did a little TikTok, a little tiktok Ruski supporting her friend Keffels. Kiwi Farms instigated so many hate campaigns and built a blueprint for online harassment. Hashtag Keffels, hashtag drop Kiwi Farms, hashtag tech, technology, Twitch, online creators, tech news. How many views did this get? Does it tell me? I don't think it says how many views. It says 200 comments, though. Wait, no. No, it doesn't say views. That's weird. Give me the voice. Arms off their services. If you've never heard of... Let's talk about why it matters that Cloudflare kicked Kiwi Farms off their services. If you've never heard of Kiwi Farms, it's a notorious hate site that people just go to basically organize harassment and doxing campaigns. For the past month, Kiwi Farms has been targeting Keffels, a trans Twitch streamer. She literally had to flee the country for her safety. And there's a really good full rundown if you Google this headline. Really well. hard, hard-hitting journalism. Got everything right. Everything right, chat. She really investigated her sources and made sure they weren't lying to her dumb fucking face. NBC by Kat Ten Barge and Ben Collins. And Washington Post also covered it. The Kiwi Farms is dangerous. Oh, Not only has the it... Washington Post also covered it? Which Washington Post, Taylor? The one you write for? Are you referring to the article that you fucking co-authored? That one? That Washington Post covered it? Hmm. Ruin the lives of countless people. Um, their whole goal is a world where LGBTQ people are not going to use social media and be out and open online. In a lot of instances, Kiwi Farms' explicit goal is to get their target to kill themselves. Um, they want these people to live in fear. As Keppel said, when a multi-billion dollar company like Cloudflare has to drop Kiwi Farms because of this imminent threat, it's no longer a matter of free speech, it's a matter of protecting public safety. And if you don't think any of this matters, just know that the tactics that Kiwi Farms pioneers are only going to be used for more and more political purposes as we heat up to the next election. I, I wish to fucking God we had the money to sue Matthew Prince in that time. I wish to fucking God I had the money. <clears throat> fucking liar. The weight of your sins, Matthew, it will crush you over time. That's Taylor Lorenz. Um, is there anything else after that? No, not really. Thanks for watching this clip. This is Willow. Remember to like and subscribe.